Hi there, welcome back to our second module uh, of the first unit in our course research on corporate transparency. So uh, and now I can um, talk about something that is very dear to my heart and this is the idea of open science. Uh, so I already said in the introductionary video that this um, course is committed to the principles of open science, but I didn't really inform you what the principles are. And, and here they are, right? So this is a definition that is, I, I, I narrowed down a little bit, but I think in principle it gets the idea very well. Um, so open science is the practice of science in such a way that others can collaborate and contribute, where research data, lab notes, and other research processes are freely available, the terms that enable reuse, redistribution, and reproduction of the research and its underlying data and methods. So now I could talk to you for hours about why this is important, why there is a Reprodu reproducibility crisis in science and whether there is such a cri uh, crisis and the reasons why maybe research is hard to reproduce or replicate, what the difference between reproduction and replication is. You know, all this is really interesting, but not the focus of this course. You know, in this course, it's all about you doing research and not it's not a meta course about, uh, you know, um, what is important in generating knowledge and whatnot. Um, so you might very well ask, well, it's good that you like open science, Joachim, but what is, does this mean for you? Why, why do you, should you think about, as a, as a young researcher, think about uh, in, in enabling or embracing open science workflows? Um, what is in for you? Yeah? So here are two things, or three things actually, um, that uh, I, I think should convince you to really uh, look into open science methods and approaches. So the first thing is, uh, open science is all about collaboration with unknown users and you might say no and I won't be collaborating with any unknown user soon I will I want to keep my stuff for myself for the time being I don't want to share I'm not in the position to share I'm a beginner I you know I don't want to give right so I I, I understand that right so but my experience is you will always be collaborating so you start a project and then maybe at some point you decide that you want to get in co-author involved yeah? Or you start a project, then you stop a project, and a year later you revisit it again. So this is what I'm labeling here, you're collaborating with your future self. It, research is always teamwork. And if, if you want to do research, you have to produce it in a way so that others can collaborate and contribute. And that means you have to develop a workflow that makes it easy for others to understand what you are doing and to picking up where you stop to work and to continue your process. Yeah? So this is extremely important. So and many researchers that I know are very good at this and some aren't, right? So and, and so that means you really have to think about your approach to doing work in a way that does it help others to understand what I'm doing. And I, I strongly encourage you to always design your projects in a way that others can collaborate. Yeah? So um, the next reason, so this, this idea of collaboration means that you will structure your, your workflow a lot and you will automate a lot of things. You will see this in a second, right? So you will, a lot of things will go where you will document in a way that you can do them almost automatically. Um, and there, uh, <laughs> A good colleague of mine, Astrid from the TRR, she, she's Dutch originally, and she once uh, said this uh, wonderful um, proverb here, uh, which I won't pronounce in Dutch because I don't want to embarrass myself, um, but I, I, I really like the gist of it. So those who are not looking for convenience are lazy. So trying to automate things in a way that, that it makes it more efficient going forward, easier for others to pick up. So make our life easier yeah, is a lot of work. Making our life easier is a lot of work, but it is the best work because once you succeed, then your life has become easier. How great is that? Yeah, so it, it really, I take great joy of automating things. <laughs> so automating things is, is a good thing. And of course, sometimes you can overdo it and you will do, you will overdo it from time to time. But in principle, the idea is if you have a workflow that allows others to collaborate and to contribute and to, to um, bridge with what you've done, that also will almost always also imply that you, get the, that you automate many steps so that you don't have to guide people through so many little things that you do. Instead, you can say, okay, here is what you need to run, okay? So 
if these these two things don't convince you that you should look into this, I guess the third thing should. It will become the norm, period. So in order to get an idea of where our profession is heading, I encourage you strongly to take a look at this link. So this is the GitHub repo or the GitHub uh, homepage basically of the AEA data editor. The AEA data editor is is involved in all submission processes in the economic, uh, American Economic Review and Satellite Journals. And if you want to go to these journals, you will have to uh, submit your analysis in a way that it is easily reproducible. And, um, and this, is, this requires some steps. So the Journal of Accounting Research can be applauded for doing a similar you know, approach. Um, not as aggressively as, as the American Economic Review, but regardless. And I think here we really have to step, our, step up our game. And, and the good thing for those of you who are new to this, um, you have a competitive advantage over all us old timers here, right? So you are, you, you know how to, uh, you know, handle your digital environment. You are, you are digital natives. Right? So whereas the older generation are whatever, late adopters or what, right? So um, it, means, it means for you, you know, this is really an advantage relative to you know, some of the more established researchers. And it's good because the more established researchers have a lot of advantages over you. So it's only fair that you also get an edge. So I, I, I certainly encourage you to, to really embrace this change and to push for it within your departments, within your groups. Okay, now, I, can, I could now continue to lecture for hours on how you know, this workflow looks like, but instead I decided that I think it might be even better uh, uh, to just you know, show you uh, uh, an example. Okay? And this example is related uh, to um, the first assignment, actually. Um, so the first assignment is, is basically will boil down to do what I just did and then do a little bit on top. Okay, so uh, we will talk about this in more detail, of course, in the uh, in the in the Q and A session and also in the um, in the assignment itself. Okay, but here what you see is the GitHub page of uh, the TRR two six six. It's a little bit bare bones, you know. We just set this up, but it already has some content that we that we like. And um, you know, two of these contents here, these are the ones that are actually linked also here, are two uh, repositories. Uh, repositories basically are, think about a repository as a, as a folder structure that you can copy to your local computer yeah, for the time being. Um, so, and, and here what you see is two repositories. Um, the first repository, Treat, is a repository that uses Words data, right? So uh, for those of you that have access to Words data, here you can, you can fork this repository and do a, a bare bones quick analysis of discretionary accruals with it. This here, this repository that I will be using for, for this um, uh, code through here is, is a repository that doesn't use WRDS data. So uh, you, know, you don't have to have any additional licenses uh, to use this repository. So this is really uh, convenient. Um, and now what I will do is I will, I will try you, uh, I will show you how um, such a project can be um, reproduced very quickly if you follow a proper um, uh, open science workflow. Yeah? To do this, I will simply copy this link, right? So then I will open R, R Studio. So of course you can also you know have reproducible workflows with other software packages. Python uh, comes to mind directly. Also other software might be good, but you know there is a certain competitive advantage to software that is in itself uh, open license because otherwise um, uh, obviously uh, you you have to have a license to reproduce uh, the work of others. This is a little bit of a letdown. So here I will be using R in this course, but if you want to com um, contribute. Perfect, uh, you know, sh send us your Python code. That's all cool. So now what I do here is I start a new project. And um, the, the advantage of our studio is that it has, um, it, it is directly connected to Git and to GitHub. Yeah? So it, all this, if all this sounds alien to you and too quick, I have additional videos for you that have you covered at some point. Yeah? So now I am, uh, you know, I just added this link to the, uh, a TRR repository and started a new project in R. So what R now does in the background is it basically copies all the files onto my local disk and now you see that I have a new project and here in the right quadrant here you see um, the files of this new project. Okay, so 
these are exactly the files that you see here on this web page. You see that, right? So just copied here on my computer. So this is now my local computer. I just copied the files, basically. Yeah, it's a little bit fancier than that, but you know, for the time it will do. So now what you see here, and this is something that you should also have as a habit, uh, in this main folder, there is a readme file, okay? So I can open this readme file, and then when I open this readme file, I see some text that informs me about the steps that I have to do, yeah? So now what we also see, I won't go through this now because I know what to do, ha ha ha, but you should read it then. Uh, so here, what you also see, there is an output folder, and the output folder is basically empty. There is this little git ignore file, don't worry about what that is, but besides this, there's nothing in it, right? So now um, we come to the beauty of a fully reproducible workflow. So now what I can do is, and this is explained here, yeah? So um, I can do basically this step here. So I, I also would like to install, I, would might, I might need to install some packages. You know, I already have these packages installed, so I don't have to do this now. So I can go directly to build, and build all, okay? So now what you see here in the upper right corner is what the computer basically does for me. So this project is a very bare bones project. It's a project template, right? It's not a full-fledged research paper, but it gives you everything that you need to write a full-fledged, uh, you know, the infrastructure that you need to write a full-fledged working paper. So you see here that um, currently what it does, it pulls some data. Yeah? So the first step of an empirical analysis is almost always getting data from somewhere. And here we are using data from the World Bank. That's, this has the last, uh, large advantage that World Bank data is, is, is freely available. Yeah? So uh, no license needed, no commercial money needed. Right, So we can directly use this data. And, and here we pull data from the World Bank. Um, that takes a while, obviously. Ah, now it's done. Okay, so now the next step is uh, we calculate data. So here it's very easy. Yeah, it just it does some um, logarithm calculations, and here we do some analysis. You know, this is the not the next step. You always see this, you know, these steps here. So do analysis, meaning you know we're calculating some stuff. Uh, we're doing some uh, regressions, and now something happens here. When you go to the output folder, you see that we have a file in here. It's called results RDA. So this is a data file that has results. Um, data files are cool, but at the same time, you normally you don't just provide some tables or whatever. So you also have a paper or something. And and now what what you see here, what is currently happening while we talk is that um, this uh, wonderful process here in R produces a paper out of a markdown file. A markdown file is a, is a text file, and, and this markdown text file is being passed through an interpreter, and this directly generates um, a PDF. Yeah? Takes a while again. Yeah? So this is using basically a LaTeX um, um, uh, environment and builds a paper. So here's a paper, right? So um, yeah, let's open the paper. Why not? Here's a paper. Yeah, so this paper we just reproduced from the code. Yeah, so you see that the paper is not that exciting, right? Uh, it's a stub. Yeah, uh, it replicates um, the Preston curve. So if you don't know what the Preston curve is, the Preston curve is uh, the association between GDP per capita and life expectancy. Uh, um, spoiler: It's positive. So meaning that. Um, uh, countries and countries uh, with larger levels of life expectancy, there also is uh, larger levels of GDP per capita, sorry, there's also higher life expectancy. Yeah? So it's just an association. So I don't, don't understand it as causal. So you see here, you know, this is not really a paper, two pages. Um, and then we have some references. Yeah, two. <laughs> okay, so here is uh, the original Preston figure. Yeah, so this is the Preston 1975 study that shows on the x-axis, you see national income per head, so GDP per capita, basically. And then you have life expectancy on the y-axis, and you see that regardless in the 30s and in the 60s, there still is, you know, there always is this uh, log type um, association. And here, this is uh, the, the real data now. 
So this is World Bank data. Looks a little bit ugly, I apologize. Um, but I just wanted to give you uh, the raw information here. So this is the association you see, and it's very much like the Preston curve. By the way, if you wonder why these are these little caterpillars, you know, these are country level observations. So, and you have, you know, each country basically has is on its own trajectory, right? So now when you look at this here, you also see, uh, you can also have tables. Yeah, so these are the descriptive statistics of the sample. These are the correlations. Yeah, and here are some regressions because why not, right? People love regressions. Um, yes, so this is, I, I reproduced this wonderful analysis within a few minutes now, right? So now uh, what you can see is when you go here, you also see, by the way, that we also have a presentation. Uh, so this is a presentation, Beamer, right? Exactly the same thing here. Sorry. So you see that here we have, you know, basically same graphs. Oh, <laughs> what a correlation table, a very large correlation table and a regression table. Yeah. And a conclusion, right? So um, all this has been uh, successfully reproduced now. And this is, I think, really neat. And, and I like it. Okay. So you see that all this is now in this folder. And you can, continu can continue to work with this. And exactly this would be your assignment, the first assignment. You know, use our repository, make it, you know, get it to your local computer, reproduce what we have done, and extend it. Maybe add in an additional control variable or, or use a different formal specification of the, of the function, right? So this is all entirely up to you. So, okay, so now we have to go back to the slide deck. Here we are. Okay, so uh, you see that this, this kind of approach helps you to do research in a way that it's easy for others to build on what you've done. Huh? So in this case, we did some work for you and all that you have to do is you, you have to use our template and then adjust it so that it becomes your project, right? And uh, um, you can dive into, you know, what we did and of course um, uh, try to understand our, our ways of coding things and you can also question our way of coding things and maybe you can do stuff better. Yeah? And, and then you can also help us by, uh, by actually issuing pull requests and help us to make these repositories better. So maybe maybe you think that hey, uh, I I don't I don't like R. I'm 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 a Python guy, so I do everything with Python. Perfect. You know, try to do the same thing with Python. And once you did it, push it. Yeah. Say commit it to our repository, and then our repository will not only be an R repository, but also a Python repository. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So it could you know it could be done. I'm sure. So, and also maybe you are a Vivid Stator user and then you can do the same thing with Stator and push it and then we have a Stator version of, of this, right? So, and then people can decide. Okay, wonderful. So this closes this video. Uh, apologies for uh, taking the extra minute, but I hope that it was interesting to you. If you're interested in the workflow itself, you know, this is longer than one video, but I have some references here for you that you can look into. And if you want to dive into one real quick, uh, the Gensko and Shapiro is a, a, almost a classic of PhD programs. I would say maybe you've seen it in your program already. Um, uh, while it is a little bit dated, it still is really uh, a good pro, a good first start into it, and yeah, it's also fun to read. I like it. And then the others are also interesting. For for example, also one thing that I personally like, uh, the Wilson et al shows you that also in other areas, not just economics, accounting, and, and, and social science, you know, the exactly same topics are being discussed. So it's, it's, it's good to see that this is very general. Last thing, the Christensen et al textbook is a really nice textbook on the whole open science world. So uh, if, if, you, if you're interested in this and you're kind of hooked, then I'm very happy. And then you should um, maybe take a look at this book. Okay, perfect. So thanks, see you around, cheers, bye.